Hello, and welcome to the C19 Weekly. I'm your host, Nicholas Tatnetti, a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. In these weekly video casts, we go over some of the latest and most interesting research on SARS-CoV-2, coronavirus, COVID-19. We highlight some of the best that from a data science and bioinformatics perspective, and try to give you some intuition for how to interpret these results and why we find them exciting. We're trying to create a snapshot of what's going on right now, not do a comprehensive review of all of the literature and all of the publications that are coming out each week. In this week's episode, we're gonna go over chaos theory and and how it might explain why all the models seem wrong. We're gonna talk about AI, artificial intelligence, as a companion diagnostic instead of or to complement PCR-based tests. We're gonna talk about a non-COVID paper this week that has some really important implications for COVID and the spread of disease. And we're gonna talk about, we're gonna present some really beautiful figures and some writing from um, a article from Nature that goes over some of the details of coronavirus protein modeling and structure prediction that have been going on that have been really impressive the last few months. First, let's talk about chaos theory. Asymptomatic estimates of SARS-CoV-2 infection counts and their sensitivities to stochastic perturbation. So the goal here was to show how even small data quality issues or small assumptions uh, issues in the assumptions that are made for models can cause huge changes. This is that classic butterfly effect that Goldblum was talking about. So um, in these issues that we say, oh, initial conditions might be slightly different, but yet they produce huge differences in the modeling. It's an area that I've been really interested in. I study adverse effects, adverse drug effects specifically, that can be very rare, but very severe. And it, it is also sensitive to these types of issues. So chaos theory is something I've been passionate about. The method they used was actually really straightforward. It was simply to evaluate the sensitivity and the robustness of existing models, either dynamical or stochastic or statistical, and to evaluate how sensitive they were to their initial conditions or the assumptions being made for their parameters. They found that small differences result in order of magnitude differences in the predictions that those models produce, and that models are likely misreporting confidence intervals in the way that they're presented now. Their conclusion is that models need to be more rigorously tested for robustness before being published and to not use the R squared because it can give you a false sense of security. R squareds can look really good and yet the models are really still very sensitive underneath the hood. So there's uncertainty in the data that's reported. This is what they were, this is what motivated them to conduct this analysis. They found that, for example, the Italian data reports COVID-19 deaths as anyone who died while being infected, even if they didn't die because of the infection necessarily, but they don't count those who died in their homes. So they might be both overcounting and undercounting the number of deaths that are attributed to COVID-19. The German data, for example, has much more comprehensive testing, so their denominator is much bigger and their death rate as a result is much lower. They note that these types of inconsistencies in the reporting that aren't accounted for in the modeling will produce really big differences in the results. Finally, who is being tested differs from country to country, and as we know, it has been changing over time as guidelines from public health organizations change over time on who should be tested. <clears throat> first, the first thing they do is they establish that the models that they have, that they're going to be evaluating, re reproduce the data very well. So here we have two different models. On the left, we have a dynamic model where you model each the infection rates and how likely it is to pass from one person to another or for surfaces. We've talked about some of these models in previous episodes. <clears throat> And on the right, we have a statistical model where they fit a logistic regression to the total number of patients who have been, uh, who are infected and attempt to predict it that way. In the dynamic model, and you can see both of them fit very well. CT is just, I'm just noting it here, you'll see that a few times maybe. CT is just the total number of infections. The statistical model is the one they evaluated first. And they did two things that were really interesting. The one was they changed the start date as when, for when the model was first trained. So they said, let's cut off the first couple of days and let's rerun the model and see if it produces the same result. That's on the left. And for the most part, it reproduces the same result, exactly as it'd be expected. On the right though, they did something else where instead of cu cutting off the first few data points, they cut off the most recent few data points. 
And when they do that, they see that the model produces wildly different results, even when trained on otherwise the exact same data. You can see there's a really big difference, several two orders of magnitude difference in the amount of people who are predicted to be infected based on just cutting off one or two days worth of data. Further, they go on to a, a note that the confidence intervals in these models are actually smaller than the thickness of the line that's drawn to represent the output of the model. So the confidence interval is, is erroneously suggesting that it's extremely, that this prediction is extremely accurate. When really, in all honesty, you can see that there's very big variation based on small changes in the data. So this is their evidence for suggesting that confidence intervals are being improperly reported in these data. Here's an analysis they did on UK data, France data, and Italian data, where they did that exact analysis, except now they kept all the data, but they randomly introduced some noise into that last day's data point. And when they randomly introduce noise into just that last day's data point, and even not that much noise, they get widely different predictions. So you can see the UK data produces a really big range of possible predictions of the total number of people infected in France and Italy produce a little bit less. Probably because they're a little bit further along in the overall infections in their country, and so the, the data are getting more accurate. So early data is more sensitive to this. The first few days of data are especially sensitive to producing models with really high varying results. One thing that I think is really interesting in the UK data is you can start to see there's a little bit of a bimodal output being set up, where some predictions are leading to some uh, introductions of noise or um, permutations in the data are leading to really vastly different sets of predictions. They also show that you can get these types of variations in the dynamical models and they describe the variance there as well. I encourage you to read that paper, it's really exciting and it's really easy read if you're ever interested in chaos theory and what it is and, and now you know a lot about SARS-CoV-2 you can read that paper really easily and get an idea of the types of analyses that chaos theories propose and do. All right. Artificial intelligence enabled rapid diagnosis of patients with COVID-19, May et al, Nature Medicine, May 19th, 2020. The goal of this study was to train an artificial intelligence algorithm or a neural network on clinical data and radiological scans to identify patients with SARS-CoV-2 without the need for a PCR test, a pharyngeal swap. The method was to use convolutional neural nets, multilayer perceptrons, clinical data, data, and CT scans to train this algorithm. What they found was that their AI algorithm could achieve expert level performance when compared to a couple of examples, a couple of radiologist experts. And um, considering that missing diagnoses could be really damaging because if somebody is diagnosed as negative but actually is positive and then goes out into the community and spreads the disease, that could cause a big problem. Um, this is a method that has higher sensitivity and so you could capture some of those and make sure that you're not missing those false negatives. Because of that, this could be a quite useful way or companion way to diagnose SARS-CoV-2. I wouldn't rely on it as the only way. This is the methodology they developed. On their input, the input data they had were full CT scans of the lungs and some clinical data that wasn't radiological. They processed the radiological data with convolutional neural nets. They processed the clinical data with multilayer perceptrons. They integrate those together and then make a prediction on whether or not the patient has the disease. This is the performance curve. So on the right, you see what's called a receiver operating characteristic curve. A cheat on how to read these curves is very simple. Basically, the closer you are to this point right here, the better the performance. So you want your line to get as close to there as possible, or you want your dot to be as close to that corner as possible. What they found was that when they integrated the imaging data and the clinical data together, they produced a better result. That's good. That means that the clinical data and the imaging data are providing different types or different amounts or sources of information. And they also found, probably most strikingly, that they were able to recover patients that radiologists had missed as being SARS-CoV-2 positive. And they can see that here. They, were, they had 25 of these patients. They were able to recover about half of them. In addition, they compared their performance directly to the experts, and they found that for specificity, their algorithm did not perform as well as the experts, but in sensitivity, it performed better than the experts. That's just saying that we could use this algorithm to supplement current processes 
and maybe capture some of those otherwise false negatives. I think that's the strongest use here. Here are some images that show what the algorithm saw in the image that made it think that a patient with SARS-CoV-2 positive and what the radiologist saw. And what you can see is here, A is an example of when the radiologist might have missed the diagnosis. And here's where the convolutional neural net is saying there's something there, there's a feature there that is indicating that this patient might have the, the virus. Here is one where it kind of matches up a little bit more closely. And here, here's one where they're both negative and they both predict negative really well. Now, I did a little bit of a Google search cost comparison, and the PCR test is cheap. It's 35 bucks approximately to run, and it takes about somewhere between an hour and 48 hours to get results. Now, it's not too bad. If it's on the hour side, on the 48-hour side, it might be a little long. This algorithm uses a CT scan. The average cost of that is around $300, so it's quite a bit more expensive. The time it takes, though, is very quick. This, you could imagine, would be very fast to run and implement, and it takes about five minutes to run these CT scans. So while it could be really quick, you could get your results back in less than 10 minutes, it is much more expensive. All right, I wanna talk about this non-COVID paper that I thought was really interesting, came out during this time, and could have some interesting implications for COVID research going forward. This is Mapping Global Variation in Human Mobility, Creamer et al., Nature, Human Behavior, published on May 18th, 2020. The goal here was to describe global human movement patterns. The method they used was Google Maps, location history data from 2016. They used differential privacy techniques to make sure they didn't analyze any individual data. And then they used statistical models to map human travel patterns. Their data covers 65% of the globe. They're biased toward more urban areas and more developed countries. And they found that socioeconomic factors and geography explain patterns in human movement. The conclusion is that we were quite social, at least we were in 2016, and I wonder what these data are going to show after this year is over in our post-pandemic future. Here is some analysis from their data. They show that travel peaks around major holidays, global holidays, and you can see that in the data right here, and they break it down also by latitude. Here's another really pretty plot. They show international travel as a function of all travel per country, and you can see countries that have that travel to each other quite a bit. It's a really fun data to set to explore, and they say that they make their data available, at least in summary form, at this link here, and that they'll make the more comprehensive data set, the private differential privacy data set, available upon request. And, but that request has to be reviewed by Google, so we'll see. Now I'm gonna talk about this news feature coronavirus piece by piece that went through the early days of mapping the structures of the most important proteins of coronavirus. It also comes with some really beautiful illustrations of proteins and the functions of coronavirus. So I encourage you to read it. It's a quick in the uh, armchair read. The sprint to solve coronavirus protein structures and disarm them with drugs. This is by school of Kodari, Nature, May 19th, 2020. The goal of this study was to document the timeline of discovering the structures of SARS-CoV-2 proteins. The method was journalism. The result was within the very first days of the sequence being available, the global scientific community mobilized. And within weeks, the first structures of these proteins were deposited, deposited in the protein databank, the PDB. The conclusion is that science can be really impressive when there is a global pandemic and something encouraging everyone to work together for the greater good. I love this because it says um, something that I love to think about is that holy shit moment. That moment when you realize you just discovered something that nobody else in the world yet knows. And it's illustrated here. Um, and I think despite the language, it's important to document that. Um, every scientist seeks this moment and you're lucky to have a, one or two in your, in your scientific career. But anyway, it goes through some of the important structures of the proteins. It talks about the scientists and the different labs that have collaborated to produce these efforts. It talks about some of the companies that are now producing vaccines. And it goes through very simply and elegantly goes to the mechanisms of infection and the important components or the important parts of that mechanism that we can target with drugs, vaccines. I encourage you to read it. Um, it's available online for everyone. Of course, on the YouTube channel in the comments, we will include links to, other, links to all of these articles and other articles that we found interesting that maybe we couldn't include. 
and a list of ongoing projects for volunteering opportunities for all of you. Remember to subscribe and you'll always hear more. And thank you all for your time. I will see you next week.